Well, I see we have a few professors here, so I thought, you know, I never got to give professors a pop quiz. We should have a pop quiz for them, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm okay with that. You okay with that? <laughs> but only for the professors, the students should now. But now, I thought what I'd say, talk a little bit about this evening is, uh, you know, why am I a Republican? Why should you be a Republican? What does it mean to be a Republican? You know, why are we Republicans? Are you Republicans because your parents were Republicans? Or are you Republicans because you belong to the country club? Are you a Republican because you're in business? Are you a Republican because you believe in the Second Amendment? Is there an overall philosophy or is there one thing that brings you to being a Republican? This is an important debate because I think a, a party, a political party, doesn't mean anything. It isn't, isn't really of any value unless it means something, unless it fulfills some message. A political party is just an empty message, and the Republican Party is no better than the Democrat Party if it doesn't stand for something. For many years, we've had sort of internal battles within the Republican Party, and some say that Reagan said there was an 11th commandment, thou shalt not criticize your fellow Republicans. Well, it wouldn't be any fun if you did, would it? You know, if we didn't strive and fight and try to shake the party to be something, it wouldn't be much fun. And besides Reagan's commandment, I'm not sure if it really was true anyway. I was there in 1976 at the convention in Kansas City, and I was 13 years old at the time, and it was a raucous place. The delegates were exactly evenly split 50-50. I mean, nobody knew who was going to win. It's probably the closest convention of the last century. There were a few states that had undecided votes, and everybody was jockeying for those states. When you won a state, you got all of the delegates. And so California, Reagan won California, and Reagan won Texas. My dad was a delegate from Texas. And I was in the audience a few different nights. But I remember one scene, and they'll show this scene sometimes when they replay uh, events from that time. There's a scene where Nelson Rockefeller is reaching for a telephone and trying to grab it from somebody. It sticks in my mind because the telephone is one of those old-fashioned rotary dial telephones you guys have probably never seen except for on television. And it's got a cord. You've probably never seen a phone with a cord. But anyway, he's wrestling with somebody over this, and here's Nelson Rockefeller, who's a billionaire, but he also represents a wing of the party. Back in those days, there were people we called the Rockefeller Republicans. We didn't really like them. We were the Reagan Republicans. But that was a, sort of the more Eastern establishment or the more liberal wing of the Republican Party. So the Republican Party hasn't always been monolithic. You can go back even farther than that and you say, well, you know, what does it mean to be a Republican? Do most Republicans say that they're conservative? I'd probably say the vast majority say they're conservative. Well, what does that mean? There was a book written in the 1964 election by Barry Goldwater and uh, called The Conscience of the Conservative. And a lot of us harken back to that, and maybe even some in this room who might remember that time, but a lot of people kind of got started. My dad was uh, active in that campaign, and Hillary Clinton was active in that campaign for Goldwater. I don't know what happened, but there's a famous quote from that book that I like, and it, 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 it begins, I have little interest in streamlining government or in making it more efficient, for I mean to reduce its size. I do not undertake to promote welfare but rather I propose to extend freedom. My aim is not to repeal, my aim is not to pass bills, but to repeal bills. My aim is not to initiate programs, but to cancel old ones that do injustice to the Constitution. I will not attempt to discover whether legislation is needed before I have first discovered or first determined whether it is constitutionally permissible. And if I am later attacked for neglecting the interests of my constituents, I, I shall reply that I was told that the interests of my constituents were liberty. And in that cause, I'm doing the best that I can. Now, it's a famous quote from Barry Goldwater's book, but it tells a little bit about maybe what it meant to be a conservative, that we weren't about passing new laws necessarily, we were about repealing bad ones, and that we felt like the Constitution should be a guide as to what uh, government does in Washington. You'll hear people refer to enumerated powers. I think there are 29 enumerated powers in the Constitution. Our government now does thousands upon thousands of things. None of them are justified by the Constitution. We recently passed a bank bailout bill. This was passed with the approval of George Bush, Mitch McConnell, and many other Republicans. Jim Buddy voted against this bill. But you ask yourself, is it constitutional? Is there anything in the Constitution that says about the government buying banks, private banks, and owning stock in banks. Not only is there nothing in the Constitution, the Republican platform that we have, that we've all agreed to, specifically says 
that we don't believe in bailing out private businesses. So here we have Republicans that go against what we profess to believe. The platform often is very good. Our state platform is good, our national Republican platform is good, but we end up getting leaders that for one reason or another decide not to adhere to the platform. Now why is this a problem? It's a consequence because in the end we lose our believability. Right now you have Republicans who stand up and they voted unanimously against Obama's stimulus package. And it's easy to be in this group and we can all bash Obama and say how horrible he is and how the spending bill is awful. But five months before that, all half of those Republicans got up and voted for the bank bill out. $800 billion. Same kind of thing. So what we've lost is our believability. And see, Obama sees it. So Obama's not a dumb guy. He stands up and he says, well, who are these Republicans to criticize me on the spending bill? When the Republicans were in power, the deficit went from $5 trillion to $10 trillion. So we've become hypocrites in a way. We haven't truly become fiscal conservatives, or we haven't followed through on the message of fiscal conservatism that we said we had. Well, some say, well, that's fine, but there were good old days. We did it one time. When we, were, when we had Reagan, we were fiscal conservatives. Well, unfortunately, even that wasn't true. When Reagan was elected in 1980, the first bill they passed was called the graham Ladder Bill in 1981, and Republicans pegged it as this great step forward. Well, Jimmy Carter's last budget was about $34, $36 billion in debt. Well, it turns out Reagan's first budget turned out to be $110 billion in debt. And each successive year, the deficit rose throughout Reagan's two terms. Now, if you're a Republican apologist, you just simply say, oh, we had the Cold War, we had to do something. And that was kind of the way Buckley reacted, and there was a split kind of in the conservatives and the Republican parties, even going back to the 50s, that some justified whatever it took. Government could be a Leviathan, government could be huge and overreaching because we had to to stop communism. But after the Cold War, we don't even have that excuse anymore for why government continues to grow and grow and grow. Some, the Democrats said, well, the deficit got really big under Reagan's administration because you cut tax rates and supply-side economics doesn't work. That debate still goes on, and there's a local Democrat here in town who I still have this debate with, and I can't convince him to look at the numbers. When they reduced tax rates, revenue did go up. So there is a certain amount of supply-side economics that does work. If you lower marginal tax rates, revenue often will go up. Not always, but often will go up. So in the 1980s, we did lower the brackets. You, brackets, you might have had a 60% bracket down to 40%, 40% went to 30, 30 went to 25. Reagan did bring the tax rates down. And if you look at tax revenue in 1981, 82, 83, 84, tax revenue did rise. Why did the deficit rise? Because spending rose more dramatically under Reagan than it did under Carter. You say, well, Reagan's a conservative, Carter's a liberal. Not necessarily always what it seems. So spending rose at a rapid rate. Now some would say, well, it was just military spending. That was to, for the Cold War, we had to spend that. Well, domestic spending rose faster under Reagan than it did under Carter. These are problems if we truly believe in something. If we believe in balanced budgets, we have to admit our failings and decide if we're going to go forward, how do we become believable again? The deficits went through the roof all the way throughout the 1980s. And then we got who we all think is the worst president of all time in our history. We were Bill Clinton. We all hated him. We hated him for eight years. But what happened to the deficit of Bill Clinton? It got better. Now, it didn't get better. Uh, it got better for a couple of reasons. One, spending may have slowed a little bit, the rate of increase in spending. Tax revenue went up because they did raise taxes early on in Clinton's administration. But another reason it probably the budget did better is because you had divided government. And uh, some would argue that divided government does better than monolithic government. USA Today did an analysis of this uh, a couple of years ago, and they analyzed state government. They said, which state government is the most fiscally conservative? All Republicans, all Democrats, or mixtures? And inevitably, every state they studied over a 10-year period showed that divided government ended up being more conservative than monolithic government. Didn't matter which party, didn't matter which one was the governor, which one was the legislature, but as long as it was divided, it was more conservative. So then we carry forward and then we elect, elect a conservative George Bush. But we have to look at what happened under the eight years of George Bush. The deficit went from $5 trillion to $10 trillion. 